Good morning and welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. Please stand and worship with us. All right, church. Come on, let's sing, huh?
Yeah, we want to say to you, we extend that. If you are new here with us, uh, it is just awesome to get the chance to worship the God of the universe with you. Welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. Yeah. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are not going to candy coat your message. We are going to dive in to who you are, learn about you. We lift up Tom as he delivers that message today about the church. And uh, Jesus, you say uh, the greatest command. Is, is to love, is to love you and, and to love your people. And so, God, I pray that that's what this church is. It's a church, uh, as we try and, and learn to understand the mystery of this life and the mystery of this relationship with you, God, that we would put love in the front of our minds in a world that is so, so short of it. We need you, God. And, and may we be that church that uh, exhibits that love. Jesus, this, this is for you. In your name we pray. Amen. You are the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Sing. 
explore you now, Jesus. I want to know everything about you. May we leave here better. Because we know what you want in our lives, God. Good morning. I want to start off first by thanking you. Uh, you guys have made this transition so nice. <laughs> your encouragement this week, your phone calls this week, uh, I just cannot thank you enough for how much that means to me and the excitement that we're feeling here in our church. I just want to say thank you. <laughs> they were so good last week, I knew we had to do it again. <laughs> now let's get serious let's pray uh father god we just thank you so much for today we thank you for your gifts that you have given each and every one of us we just ask that you be with us this morning during this time of worship i just ask that you be my words today so that i can be your hands and feet and deliver the message that you need me to deliver and let those people hearing that hear what you need them to hear thank you so much for being with us today in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, how was everybody's week? Good. Uh, like I said, I've had a good week. We talked about last week, we talked about new beginnings. So this morning, I want to kind of continue on that theme. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Acts this morning. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and find Acts 2, 42 through 47, we'll be looking at that here in a few minutes. Now, the reason I've chosen this is because... This is probably the first beginning, or this is the first beginning of the Christian church. Jesus had already ascended into heaven, and he had 120 followers at this time. And this is the beginning of the Christian church as we know it. And what's amazing about this story is these 120 people has now grown to over 2 to 3 billion people today. That number's a little hard to figure out because yeah, some people claim, some people don't. So, so the, the best estimate we have is about one-third of the population today is Christian. So that tells us we have a lot of work to do. Uh, Two-thirds of the people still need to know who Jesus Christ is. And since this original 120 people had a little bit of success with that, I thought we would use their beginnings to kind of refocus ourselves on. And that number 120, I think, is an interesting number because that's about the same size that we are. So if 120 people can make this kind of impact, what kind of impact can we make on our world? Not only our families and our friends and our community, but to the world. So I want you to think about that as we go through this morning's story. And... Um, Think about how we can really affect the world. So let's look at Acts 2, 42 through 42, or 42 through 47. They developed themselves to the apostles. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the, of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, at the time that this is written, Jesus had ascended back into heaven. He had sent his disciples back to Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, a few days before, they had gotten the Holy Spirit. Peter had just preached his big sermon. Their numbers had started to grow. And this is kind of a description of those people. So I want us to look at that this morning and break that, that scripture down a little bit. There's four things that it says that they were devoted to. In verse 42, it tells us that. The apostles' teachings, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So I want us to take each one of those this morning and look at those and see how we, as a church, as an individual, are fulfilling that and how we should be fulfilling that. First, let's look at the teachings of the apostle. Verse 43 says, everyone was, was filled with awe at the, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, we don't have the apostles here this morning, but we do have their teachings. They're right here. So, we have the same things that, that those early Christians had. We have God's word. We have his word, and it's important for us to know this word. It says they were devoted to the apostles' teachings. Are you devoted to knowing what's in this book, the apostles' teachings? I think the Bible is probably the best source for comfort, for encouragement. For any and everything you're going through, this, this book has a solution for it. Jesus is the living word, and we have the ability to have him in our hearts every single day if we just accept him. We have the Holy Spirit that we receive when we become a Christian, and that Holy Spirit helps us understand what's in this book. They call it the living word. Why? Because it changes. No, not because it changes. <laughs> because when you read it, there's different times at different times when you've needed something different out of it or how God will point out something or how it will speak to you as an individual because you are an individual and God treats you as so, even when you're reading something that everyone else is reading. So I challenge each of you to read your Bible daily. If you've been a Christian for a few years, I hope you've already finished this book at least once. If you haven't, it's time you did, especially if you've been a Christian of several years. Every day that you pick up this book and start your day with his teachings just gives you a whole new light to what that day can be. We know the scripture is from God. If you look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book equips us for everything. That's how important it is. Those early Christians, they were devoted to the teachings of the apostles. They also was, a, was devoted to fellowship. If you look at verse 44 through 46, it kind of talks about a little bit of that. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Now that word fellowship, I think, is a big word. It entails a lot of different things. Fellowship can be just hanging out with each other. Fellowship is what we're doing this morning. Fellowship is when we get together in a Bible study. And see, we can even start to blend these two together. Bible study and fellowship. Fellowship is a time when we get to know each other a little better. Now, this one verse in here that I know just throws people for a loop, and it's that money verse. But I want us to look at that because I think that's important. Sometimes we have to remember the context of when this was written. It says that um, 
They sold their possessions. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, I think if we look at what that means, it doesn't say they sold all their possessions. It doesn't say that. It says they sold possessions to fit the needs. I think we live in a different type of world right now. Most of us either work or have a regular income. We get a check. In this day and time, a lot of the people had, didn't have that regular daily income. And so when something, they needed something, they sold something or traded something. I grew up on a farm. And, I, and my, on both sides of fam, my family had farms. And I remember that throughout the year, my grandparents would uh, plant different crops so they'd have money coming in it throughout the year. I also had an uncle that was a cattle farmer. And when he needed money, he would load two or three cows on the truck and go sell them and have money. And I think that's kind of what this is talking about. We, but we today, we tithe. And that's what our tithing offerings are, are, are about. So I think when you look at this, it's not telling you to sell all your possessions and bring them in and give them to us. It just says do your part. When there's a need, we take care of it. How do we take care of it? The church physically doesn't have an income. We don't have products that we sell. We, de we de depend on, on you guys. And I think it's when we look at this and we start fe having fellowship with one another, we start seeing the needs of, of people. When you spend time with someone and get to know them more on a personal level, you get a chance to find out what their needs are. And when we find out those needs as Christians, we're supposed to meet those needs, either as a church or as an individual. And so I think when we look at fellowship, we have to look at taking care of each other in all ways. Now, do we have to wait for the church to make all this fellowship happen? No, we can't do that. We have to take our own responsibility for ourselves to be more than just a Sunday morning Christian. Sunday morning, you don't have time to truly get to know each other. That's why it's important to be part of a group or a Bible study. It's also important to do other things, fun things with each other. I understand there was a group that went to see a movie yesterday. You didn't wait for the church to organize that. That's what being a church family is all about. That's what sharing our lives is all about. Getting together throughout the week. They met daily in the temple courts. How are we meeting each other throughout the week? Is Sunday morning the only time you see your church family? I hope not. There's so much to life that we can share with each other. And I think that's what fellowship is all about. Fellowship is not just something that we try to fit into our Christian checklist. Fellowship is important. Fellowship will challenge us. It will encourage us. It helps keep us accountable to each other. Fellowship shows obedience to God and his word. Don't neglect being devoted to fellowship with each other. There's such a reward from that. So they read their Bibles, or were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. They did fellowship together, took care of each other, did life together. The other thing it says is that they broke bread together. Verse 46, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, breaking bread here, I think, has a couple of different meanings. One, we're talking about communion. Jesus on his... Last night with the, with the, apostles, the disciples, blah, 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 <laughs> set an example for what it was he wanted us to do as a meal to remember what he was about to do on the cross. We call it Holy Communion. We do it every Sunday here. The juice represents his blood. The bread represents his body. These early Christians were devoted to following what, what Jesus had asked them to do. Do this in remembrance of me. And I think we should be devoted to remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross and doing it in the way he asked us to do it. The other thing is sharing meals, true share, truly sharing meals together. You learn a lot about someone when you sit down and have a meal with them. Some good, some bad. <laughs> and again, you don't have to wait for us to have a potluck to do that. 
And as you can see, now this one sharing uh, meals together and fellowship, now they're kind of tying into each other. I know a few weeks ago, I had a, uh, there was a new restaurant that I wanted to try out. So I put it out there, hey, I want to go to this restaurant. Who wants to go with me? And about eight people showed up. We had a good time. We had some great fellowship. We didn't pull out the Bible to have a Bible study. That wasn't what it was all about. It was just sharing a meal, sharing some time with each other, getting to know one another on a more intimate level. During that meal, I learned several things about some different people, some things that I needed to follow up on, some people that needed my assistance. And we laughed, and we had a good time. So I challenge you, don't wait for us to organize something. Get together throughout the week. Share a meal. The Bible is full of meals. The people in the Bible like to eat, too. <laughs> All of their festivals had some kind of big meal planned around it. You look at Jesus. When he's talking, every time he goes to someone's house, they're planning a feast. So he gets to sit at the table. So you see fellowship around a dinner table quite often throughout the Bible. So don't wait for that potluck. Make your own potluck. Get to know each other on an intimate level. Share life with each other. You never know how that one invite that you may have to someone may be the cure to the loneliness that that person is going through. Or that you may be able to connect with someone that will help you through something you're struggling through. It's when we get to know each other that we really know how to reach out to each other and to help each other and to serve each other. So these early Christians, they were devoted to the Bible, fellowship, breaking of bread. And the fourth thing it says they were devoted to was prayer. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I think sometimes prayer is given a bad name because we say, oh, we'll pray for you. And how many times do we say that? Do we really mean it? How many times do we hear it that we really believe that that person will do it? But prayer is the most powerful weapon that we have. Prayer is something that develops this intimate relationship with you and God. Prayer changes lives. So if you take prayer lightly, you're missing out on something huge. And you're really taking the power of God lightly. If you look at Jesus throughout his ministry, he is constantly going off to be by himself to pray. Now, Jesus is God. Why does he need to go pray? Well, he was human at the time. And he needed that close connection to God. And prayer was the way he got that. Same way we get it. That intimate time that we can spend having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with the creator of the universe. And Jesus has made it so simple for us for what he did on the cross. He's given us that open line to God that we take for granted so much. When someone asks you to pray for them, don't say, I will. Do it. Take their hand. Sit down with them. So let's do this right now. Prayer doesn't have to be something big, elaborate, and fancy. It has to be from the heart. And if you truly care about this person, you're truly living the Christian faith, and you're truly letting Jesus be in your heart, Prayer should be easy. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared to pray out loud in front of someone. Now, I'm not going to ask you to get up here and pray. That's a little bit bigger step. Now, some of you, I may start doing that. But right now, we're going to keep it simple, one-on-one. -on -one. But think about how many times somebody's prayed with you, how that made you feel. Prayer is powerful. I'm standing here today because of prayer. There is no way on earth that I would be standing in this spot if it hadn't been for prayer. 
12, 13, however many years ago it was, when I was on the street and my sister didn't have a connection with me, my sister's a big prayer warrior. She prayed for me. She prayed for my protection. She prayed that I would find my way back to God. She prayed all kinds of prayers for me. And I knew that. And I knew she was doing that. Because that's who she was. The thing I guess surprised me was several years later when I finally went back to visit and I go to her, to her, to her church, I find out not only was she praying for me, she had her whole church praying for me. And I look back over that time and I see so many times when I should have been consumed by what I was going through. But there was like this invisible wall of protection around me all that time. And there was always these reminders that God was, in, that was there, that Jesus was there. And he kept me from doing a lot of crazy stuff. And as I walked in that church that morning and people started talking to me, I had this one lady, and I'll never forget it. She walked up to me and she goes, I had to see you face to face. I heard you were here. And I'm thinking, who does she think I am? <laughs> When I was younger, they said I used to look like Patrick McDuffie, but I don't know. <laughs> and some of you probably don't even know who that was, is, do you? The man from Atlantis? No. <laughs> Dallas? He was on Dallas, too. Anyway, that was in my high school days. But this lady comes up to me, and she goes, I had to, to see you in person. And, I, and so I was a little confused, and she goes, we've been praying for you. And I wanted to see what answered prayers looked like in person. That <laughs> just let me know how powerful prayer was and how much she believed in prayer. That's the prayer life we need to have, that we truly, honestly believe when we go to God in prayer that he's going to answer our prayers. Let's be a church of prayer. So these early Christians were devoted to the teachings of the apostles, they were devoted to fellowship in each other, sharing meals, and prayer. Well, the last line, verse 47, shows us the results from those things. And to me, this just shows how powerful those four things can be for us as a church. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Guys, it's simple. Building a church is not a big, complicated thing. It's loving each other. It's following Jesus. It's following what God teaches us. It's following what's in this book and living it out, sharing it with each other. Not just showing up on a Sunday morning, saying, hi, how was your week? Really, truly living this book out teaching it to each other, and living it with each other. Our lives should make the non-believers out there want what we have. It should make them want to believe in what we believe in, not their unbelief. But we've got to be ready when those opportunities come. We have to be ready to have fellowship with those people. We have to be able to intelligently share his word with them. And we have to be willing to step out on that scary limb and pray with them. So our little 120 can make a huge difference in this world. And we are. And I want to share some of that with you this morning. We not only are sharing life in our own community and here, but because of our tithe as a church, we're able to reach people around the world. I want to introduce you to Godfrey, if you don't know who Godfrey is. Godfrey, we've had a relationship with Godfrey for the best I can figure about 15 years. Godfrey is a missionary in Uganda. When we first got with Godfrey, with Godfrey, he was planning a church and starting a Christian school. And he needed some help with that. And he started reaching out. 
And we were one of the early ones that helped him. Now, Godfrey's ministry has grown tremendously since then. Godfrey is no longer just a minister in a village. He's took up on the call of, of being a church planner. Hold up on that slide right there. Um, and he has gone out into his, his communities, and he's planning all these churches. His goal is to have a church in every village. And these pictures, that one before, and even this one, are a couple of pictures of his churches. Now, I want you to look at this one specifically. The church is not the building in the background. The church is these sticks beside the building. When they get ready to have a service, they go and gather banana leaves and put it on the top for shade or to keep the rain off of them. This next is also a picture of another one of his churches. Could you imagine going to church on Sunday morning here in America to something like that? It's packed, though. Most of these people have walked miles to be at this church. We're helping affect this ministry on the other side of the world. But I wonder what they would think about our comforts in this building here. I wonder if I put up that building down the street, how many of you would show up to worship God in that building? This next building are, is a picture of Godfrey's. A few years ago in 19, or 20, 19, wow, 2014, <laughs> his ministry had grown to a point where he needed a larger building for himself. He, at this point, he has planted over 125 churches. There is no telling how many people that has affected. And we're part of that. If he averages 25 people at every church, that's 2,500 people. That's just the base value. Well, anyway, he starts this building. They need a new building. This is their new building. How would you think if you saw somewhere in Scottsdale that building being built? One, it's not even two before. It's just uh, six that they found in the jungle. The bricks that they're using are all different kinds because they're from all different other buildings that are falling down and they've gathered up. In December, we didn't... Uh, there was a question that he needed answered, and we didn't know that that was out there. They didn't have a roof for this at the time or the money to put it on there. In Jan this was in December. In January, they were having a conference. He was bringing all of his ministries, ministers in to teach them a little bit more about what their job was. And they were going to be meeting in this building. January is their rainy season. We happened to make a phone call or an email about that time to Godfrey. He said, hey, what do you need? They needed a roof for this building. Show the next slide. That's our roof. <laughs> With Godfrey, we've been able to help a lot. But I want us to look at, at, at the smiles on these faces and how happy these people are to be in this type of building. Do we have that same type of joy that they have? We can change lives just like Godfrey is around the world if we have something that everybody wants. This is a huge thing in, in Uganda. There's a huge re revival going on there because people are doing these four things. We can have the same kind of reaction here in South Scottsdale. This week... Billy Graham passed away. And I wanted to share some of his words. Because it kind of ties all of this in together. And I thought it was just a perfect fitting for how to end this service today. On his 99th birthday back in November, he released, he released a video encouraging people to seek God with their whole lives. That video turned out to be his last message. This is what he said in the video. I've been praying that we might have a spiritual awakening. I think that that becomes possible only to, as individuals surrender their lives afresh and new to Christ. To truly live the Christian life, first we must do everything we can to follow the footsteps of Jesus. Live a life in which we love one another, 
we help one another, and we live according to his word as Jesus lived. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us live that type of lifestyle, this new lifestyle. It's one of love, gentleness, and patience. All of these things that are fruits of the Spirit. I want to stress the importance of reading the Bible every day. You read his word every day, the Bible. I know it's very difficult, but you need to start somewhere. And I suggest you start with the book of Luke in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, the very first verse, verse, in the beginning, God. Intimacy with God is essential. And this must be, must be achieved through prayer. Because this is when we have that opportunity to meet God one-on-one. Go to your knees and pray until you and God have become intimate friends. I cannot describe to you the joy and peace he gives as a result of the daily routine that you have when you meet him in prayer every day. So this morning, as we look back at the first church, as we look back at the things that they were devoted to, I want you to look at your own life. How devoted are you to those, first, to those four things we've talked about this morning? As the praise team comes back up to do their last song, I want to give an invitation out. I want you to think about, is today the day that God is knocking on your heart and Jesus is saying, let me in? If that's the case, I asked you to come up this morning and let me pray with you. Maybe God's calling you to do something new. Step out of your comfort zone. Step out into a, a new beginning. Come let me pray with you for that. Or maybe you're just struggling with something. Something that is so heavy on your heart that you just don't think you can handle on your own. Or maybe there's something exciting going on and you just want some prayer of encouragement. Let me pray with you. And like last Sunday, if you don't need me to pray with you and you want to pray on your own, come here to the feet of Jesus. One of these days, I will want to see this whole floor covered with people bowed down praying. Because that's what it's all about. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word, for your ability to let it to, to reach each and every one of us through that. Today, I just ask that if there's anyone here that needs to understand what it is to be a follower of you, that they take that first step and reach out and let us let us help direct you into that that, that path. There's nothing more rewarding than having Jesus as my intimate friend. May everyone in this room feel that. We just love you and we thank you for this opportunity this morning. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen.
I just got to say that last week and today, um, you guys take my breath away because you can sing. And you've been so foolhardy, but um, you're not fooling me anymore. You guys can sing. And last week during Oceans and the proverbial stepping out for our church, you guys were loud and a church on fire and um, singing like we had everything to live for by the hand of Jesus pulling us out of that water. And it was moving and it was touching and it stuck with me all week. And you guys didn't just disappoint just now. You guys were amazing. And um, we need to be a church on fire. As Tom said, like Godfrey's church in Uganda, that is a church on fire. That is a church where Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross is everything and the only thing and our greatest purpose in each of our lives that choose to take up our cross and claim Jesus as our Savior and our own. It's our everything. In Revelation 3, to the church of Laodicea, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire and not the earthly gold. So that you can become rich in the spirit of Jesus Christ and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. So at this time of communion, the trays will be passed and we eat the bread in remembrance of his body given on the cross and we drink the juice in remembrance of his blood that was shed for all of our sins and our forgiveness and our eternity with him. And he goes on to say in Revelation, Jesus says, here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So at this time of communion, brothers and sisters, I just pray that we are a church on fire. We are not a lukewarm church. And we take this moment of remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we count that as our truest, greatest, and truly only blessing that really matters, God. And uh, let's pray as we remember. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our spiritual food, and everything we need to endure this life here on earth, and for the promise that we'll be with you in eternity, God. Help us to remember that this is a passing season, and that our ultimate home is with you, God. But in the meantime, while we are your hands and feet, while we are your church, let us not be consumed with the building with what our brothers and sisters are doing, God. With the things that are perilous and despairing and hard around us, God, help us to be fixed on you. and Remember what you've given us in Jesus Christ on the cross, God. As we take the bread and drink the juice, help us to remember Jesus' body on the cross. His blood shed for each and every one of us, God. And help us to be on fire because of that great love and that unfailing grace you've given us. In the name of Jesus, we take this time of communion. We remember you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Hey, please stand with us as we close. Here we go.